Heavenly Father, your blessings are perfect. All that you give us is good. From creation to the end, your gifts bring life to this earth. Teach us to accept what you've given. May we not always, sorry, may we always understand circumstances, but show us how your blessings are amazing and that we give you gratitude for all the gifts that you give us. Rain your blessings on our friends and families today, Father. Give us hope for whatever we face and whatever they face. May they recognize the good and perfect gifts that are from you. Thank you for your blessings that never end, Father God. We ask that you come into this study, God, and just guide us through this last two chapters of Esther, God. Amen. Good morning, guys. That was a quick, simple prayer. Um, I want to dive quickly into this because we're going to be finishing up the book of Esther, which is insane. I can't believe we are just about done, basically, after today. Uh, let me just fix the camera a bit. And I'm going to be honest with you guys right now. My notes that I did for this are not the best, simply because... I personally didn't see a lot from the last two chapters. Like, I got some stuff, but um, not as much as I did with the last couple of chapters. Um, and good morning, everyone. But, yeah, I didn't get quite a lot out of it. So, I'm hoping you guys got a lot more than probably what I got out of it. But, um, you know, so... Chapter 9, I titled this one God's Hedge of Protection because this is all about the Jews getting their victory over their enemies. Um, and before I get in, for those who are going to watch this on YouTube later or the replay, um, I'm going to be using the Micron 01 Archival Ink Pen. And I've been liking it. It's it's a nice pen. Um, you know, it writes nice. It's a fine pen. I think this is a point twenty-five, if I'm not mistaken, but it's like a really, really fine point like super fine but um yeah i'm gonna be writing with that i have my sharpie pen as a backup just in case and this is a 0. 0.7 i believe or a 0. 0.5 but i'll show you guys the difference i'm probably gonna do a video on youtube with my favorite pens to use but you can see the difference there and i have my crayola super tips markers i really just use these two um, the peach and the pink just because they're really light colors and I have the twistable crowns I mean sorry pencils twistable pencils not crowns um, the Crayola twistable pencils my sharpie smear god highlighters and lastly my zebra or zebra mouth liners let me just open that up I have my post-its I have a large one and these two that I got from Walmart and then a peach kind of color just in case you never know but um yeah so like I said I titled chapter 9 God's Hedge of Protection because it's all about um the Jews winning victory over their enemies and it's broken up into two parts their victory and then the second part which is about the feast that were um instituted it, there were two different feasts but um i think this bible only talks about one of them like names it one so we're gonna go in to verses one through ten one through ten and i don't know how to pronounce a lot of these names once we get to like verse six down um because those are the names of Haman's son so bear with me as i try to pronounce them in the best way possible but yes I will say that the key verse that I picked out, which I always put on the printables, but never really mentioned. But the key verse that I got for this was um, verse one from chapter nine. So let me just move the comments out of the way so I can see. And OK, so for those of you who are new, who will be watching this on YouTube or new to the group or will watch the replay. I normally read through by paragraph, then I circle words that I want to define, and then I go in and underline or box anything that's important and take my notes. So just reading through, and hopefully you guys can see this close enough. I'm holding up the Bible. Um, and this is the ESV translation as well. The Jews destroy their enemies. 
chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, which is a month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who, had, who hated them. The Jews gathered in the cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. No one could stand against them, for fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and satraps, I believe this is how you say that, satraps, I'm not sure, but satraps and governors and royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, where the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. Verse 5. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed uh, Parshendatha and Dalphon and Aspta and Portha and Adelie. Adelie? I don't know. And yeah, I'm not even going to attempt to go through, but verse 7 and 8 basically leads up to verse 10, which are the 10 sons of Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they laid no hands on the plunder. So yeah, we just read through that minus verses uh, 7, 8, and 9 because I cannot pronounce his children's names <laughs> but i would say um definitely look up his the children's names i think we did this before but i'm not 100 percent sure if we did um i could have sworn we did but i can't find those notes now but I, I believe his children's names were um quite interesting when i did look them up previously so if i can't find those notes in the other printables i definitely will um insert them into the printable for chapter nine but um so now we're just gonna circle words So, I only had a few. I think I have three. So, I circled uh, mastery is what I want to circle. Um, I believe fear. I wanted to circle and fame. I wanted to circle. So, mastery, fear, and fame are the three words that I wanted to define for myself. I'm going to use a Sharpie pen right now to write on the post-it. And again, this post-it is from Walmart. So, mastery. Is complete control of something, the upper hand in a contest or competition. Complete. Control. Of something the upper hand sorry you guys can't see what I'm writing on um, the upper hand in a contest or competition then we have fear And this is dread or to be afraid of. So we understand that this is not the same fear that we have when it comes to God. This is the complete opposite of that fear. And then fame. Now for fame, I did look up the Hebrew word. So the Hebrew word is shoma. Which is S H O M A, meaning a report and popular or claim. So mastery is complete control of something, the upper hand in a contest or competition, fear um, in a sense of what we're talking about in this particular sentence is 
dread of or to be afraid of and then fame the hebrew word of that is shoma which means a report but in the english dictionary it also means a popular acclaim so i'm going to use brown for fear let's use this orangey red for mastery and then mm, this yellow for fame So now going back into verse 1. Okay, so now in the 12th month, which is a month of Adar, on the 13th day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them. So I'm going to underline on the very day. When the enemies of the Jews hope to gain mastery over them. I'm also going to underline the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. So for this portion where it says on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hope to gain mastery over them. Basically many people hated the Jews in the Persian Empire. But many didn't say or do anything about it. Until they got the okay from the king which was basically through... Haman's um, edict that he wrote in the king's name. So I'm going to write. Oh, I was trying to figure out what that was. Many hated the Jews, but kept quiet. Until the edict by Haman gave them a chance to act. So that edict that Haman wrote was basically like a green light for those who hated them. It's kind of like... um. I don't even know what I wanted to say just now. <laughs> but that's that one. And then where it says the reverse occurred, the Jews gained mastery over them. Um, basically, the Jews had a great king um, besides the earthly king. And that king was, had all the resources to help them with their enemies. Um, yeah. And I'm going to write that on a post-it. I'm going to start off with this big post-it, so. Verse 1. The Jews had a great king, or had the great king. Who had all the resources. Their enemies only had their own understanding. And that actually reminds me of the, um, sorry. So, verse 1 where it says the reverse occurred and the Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. Basically, the Jews had the great king who had all the resources. Their enemies only had their own understanding in mind. Um, and it kind of reminds I don't know where the scripture is, if it's in Psalms or Proverbs. I can't remember. But um, it's a scripture that says um, not to lean on your own understanding. 
we will never understand things the way they should be done. And the Jews understood that themselves, so they leaned on God's help. They leaned on his understanding and were able to win and subdue their enemies. Whereas these enemies that lived in the Persian Empire only thought of, thought from their own understanding. They only thought from their own mind, their own emotions. So obviously they lost against these great people. Um, if someone can tell me what scripture that is, because I cannot remember right now. Because I do want to write that scripture down. And I'll check the comments in a second, you guys. Actually, let me look at it now. Eh. Hey, sis. Good morning, Tanya. Um. Okay, so moving to verse 2. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. Um, so I'm going to underline to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all people and i'm going to underline this whole verse too this whole part of the verse too so i have to lay hands on them those who sought their harm and then i also have and no one could stand against them for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples Okay, let me fix this camera because the way my hand is, is like uncomfortable. That's better. So to lay hands on those who sought their harm. Basically, the Jews were prepared to defend themselves by any and all means necessary within God's will and reasoning. So... Now, they weren't just going to go randomly on a killing spree. It had to be within reason of God's will and his purpose, which was to protect themselves, not just because they wanted to. Um, so I have a cross reference, which is Psalm 71. Yeah, 71 and 13. So let's go to Psalm 71, 13. And it says, may my accusers be put to shame and consumed with scorn and disgrace. May they be covered who seek my hurt. So those who sought to hurt them were basically going to be harmed back. And then, and no one could stand against them for the fear of them had fallen on all the peoples. Basically, God placed fear on those seeking to harm his people. I feel like that was kind of like a warning to the, the enemies of the Jews to walk away from this killing spree. Um, it was kind of like that yellow light to get you to slow down for a second. 
before you actually went and did what you wanted to do. So I felt like people had enough time. They were warned plenty of times. I mean, back in um, chapter eight, where is it? It said that a copy of what was written to be issued as a decree in every province being publicly displayed to all the peoples and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So these people had plenty of time to change their minds. They had so many signs to change their mind and chose not to do so. So, I mean, they basically got what they deserved, even though that sounds so wrong, but that's what it was. So, um, God placed fear. On those seeking to harm his people. I'm going to have to rewrite my notes later because this looks like chicken scratch. This was a warning. to stop the killing before it began. And this is, it reminds me of um, when Zeresh, I believe that's how you say Zeresh Haman's wife had warned him that um, if Mordecai was of the Jewish people of or the Jews, he would not have um, overcome him, but he would have been overcome by him. And I feel like these enemies of the Jews, because they're not saying, so the people within the Persian empire that did not like the Jews are basically going down that same route that Haman picked, um, not taking heed to the warning signs. And a lot of us do that nowadays. Um, God will give us warning signs and we just don't take heed to it. And then we end up not killed, obviously, but you know, some of us can become spiritually dead. Some of us put ourselves in situations that we don't need to be in all because we chose not to listen to the warning signs that he gave us to stop the killing spree. Okay. Color because everything starts to hurt my eyes when it's not in color. Good morning, Nora. Just looking at the comments. Actually, let me open it on my computer. Okay. Um, verse 3, all the officials of the provinces and satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews. For the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. So I'm underlining all of this as one thought and then that as a second thought. So the whole thing of verse 3, just in two different thoughts. So um, the first portion... All the officials of the provinces and satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews. Um, the second edict had to be more powerful than the first because the king's own people helped the Jews to kill those seeking to harm them. And it's kind of like they gained allies. So, So the second edict had more weight than the first. And then I have 
two cross references, which are Ezra 8 and 36, and then Proverbs 16 7. So again, um, for that part where it says all the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, um, the Jews gained allies. The second edict had more weight than the first and then two cross references, which are Ezra 8, 6, I mean, sorry, 8, 36 and Proverbs 16, 7. I'm going to read that in a second, guys. Sorry, just preparing this. Okay, so Ezra 8 and 36, which is not too far. Okay, so... Right here, Ezra 8.36, it says they also delivered the king's commission to the king's satraps and to the governors of the province beyond the river, and they aided the people in the house of God. So this is something that tends to happen um, quite often with God's people. They end up getting help from like the officials and governmental, um, people in governmental positions. In Proverbs 16.7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And um, I like that, not saying that the officials and stuff were enemies of them, but I'm pretty sure that some of these enemies, um, sorry, some of these officials did not care for the Jews, but God still made a way for them to assist the Jews. It says they helped the Jews to kill the enemies of the Jews. So I kind of like how that played out. Um, and fear of Mordecai had fallen on them, which is here. Basically, Mordecai was a man of God. Therefore, people had no other choice but to fear the man that was plotted against, but then took the very spot that Haman did. Um, Mordecai. Was a man of God. He was plotted against, saved by God, and given Haman's position. Moving on to verse four, um, for Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame spread thro throughout all the provinces for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. Um, I'm just going to bracket that because I have quite a lot to say. Not a lot, but um, there's a lot to that that I want to say. So verse four. Mordecai was a man of influence and power. He never took his power for granted. He always used them in the most responsible way possible. Um, he was for the people and not against them. His favor with God basically granted him favor with man in the Persian Empire. And I have three cross references for that, right? Yes, okay. So um, Mordecai was great in the king's house. His fame, I'm going to underline, uh, great in the king's house. Fame spread throughout grew more and more powerful it all connects to what i'm getting ready to write now but those are like what i want to make sure i remember when i get to those notes so we're going to use green and i'm just underlining them
He was a man of influence and power. Never took power for granted. Cared for the people. Favor with God. Favor with Persian Empire. And again, this is just me shorthanding what I wrote. And I have C is Second Samuel three and one. First Chronicles eleven and nine. And then Psalms ninety one fourteen. So for that whole thing of verse four, he was a man of influence and power. He never took his power for granted. He cared for the people, and his favor with God gave him favor with the people of the urgent. Persian Empire. Then I have the cross references. So the first one is Second Samuel three and one. So three and one, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And um I'm gonna compare this to the situation with him and Haman. Haman became weaker and weaker and obviously Mordecai became stronger and stronger then we have first chronicles 11 9 11 9 is here and David became greater and greater for the Lord of hosts was with him so the same kind of thing with Mordecai he became greater and greater because he had the favor of God with him God was obviously with him within all of these circumstances and then Psalms 91, 14. And Psalms 91 is like my favorite scripture. I've read the whole thing in its entirety. Is my favorite. But um, 14. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. And that is exactly what happened. Um, Mordecai clung to God um, within the situation that occurred with Haman. He didn't go out on his own. He didn't seek to get revenge. No. He mourned, obviously, for his people. Um, and through his mourning, he was able to tell Esther what happened. And then he talked to Esther, basically telling her what God's purpose was for her. So this he was definitely a man of God. Um, and within doing that, God was able to deliver him and protect him from the harm from Haman and protect all of his people, considering that they also had a three-day fast um, where they all prayed to God for deliverance. So, verse 5. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. So, I'm going to underline did as they please to those who hated them. Basically, their actions to defend themselves was necessary and it was justified. Their actions were necessary to their survival, obviously, so necessary. And all completely justified by God because he helped them within this battle. So necessary and justified. So that's why they could basically do as they pleased. If I'm going too fast, just let me know. I don't feel like I'm going too fast, but let me know if I'm going too fast for you.
So skipping down to 7 through 10, um, you basically have all of the sons of Haman named. And then it says the 10 sons of Haman, the son of Hamethida, the enemy of the Jews, but they laid no hand onto the plunder. So starting at verse 10, I'm going to underline also killed, skip down to 10, the 10 sons of Haman. And then I'm going to also underline, they laid no hands on the plunder. Verse 7 through 10 is all connected, but I don't feel like underlining all of the, the, like, I just didn't feel like doing all that. So also killed the 10 sons of Haman. And obviously between 7 and 10, you have the list of their names. So let me use blue for that. And like I said, I, I would say look up their names. Um, I feel like I've done this already, but I'm not sure. So we'll see if I have the notes for that. But um, so verses 7, and, 7 to 10, basically Haman's family line no longer lives. And this goes back to his descendants and Saul's issues, which I feel like um, this was the antithesis of Saul's disobedience. And we're going to get into that when I go down to verse 13. I'm going to explain that further. Um, but the fact that he and his sons are no longer alive goes back to when Saul was commanded to, not commanded, but when God told Saul to kill the king of the, I'm, I, I'm, uh, let's just go to the scripture now because I can't remember the name. It's 1 Samuel 15. Basically, if you read all of 1 Samuel 15, um, but this is when, where is it, 2 and 3. Thus the Lord of the Lord of hosts um, says, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox, sheep, camel and donkey. So... Basically, God commanded that Saul go and kill all of Amalek. All of them. Don't save anyone. Don't even save the animals. Like, to kill every single person. But he chose not to do that. If I'm not mistaken, he saved the king. Um, If we go down to verse 8. Mm. Okay, so yeah, starting at verse 7, it says, And Saul defeated the Amalek Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, and he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul had people spared, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and lamb and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. So basically, instead of destroying them, he saved the king, and then the king ends up, I guess, having another family tree down the line which included Haman and this is all now punishment from what took place back in first Samuel hopefully that just made sense the way I explained it but yeah like I said this goes back to um Haman's descendants and Saul's uh family issues I mean Saul's issue of disobedience and not listening to God so in the end all of the Amalekites were still destroyed if that makes sense. So, um, antithesis of Saul's disobedience. generational consequences and this also lets me know that whatever god commands it will get done whether it's done the next day in five years in 20 years in 100 years whatever god commands you to do if you disobey him it will still get done maybe not in your time but you have to keep in mind that your sins and consequences always run down the, the line to the children and the grandchildren and stuff like that so i think that's a very powerful um thing to remember and at least what I got of that I got out of this verse
in but they laid no hand on the plunder which is the rest of verse 10 Um, basically, they have permission to plunder the goods, but they chose not to do so, understanding that God would provide all their needs. And also because they understood the situation between the Jews and um, the Amalekites, which are that of Haman and his son's people. So, again, it goes back to that generational problem, that generational feud that was ensued between Saul and Agag, the king of the Amalekites. So, sorry, had permission to plunder, but knew God would not approve. Taking from the people of, I don't even know how to pronounce that, I mean spell that, so let me go back, <laughs> it was 1st Samuel, right, no it's A M. I I don't even know what else, A-M-A- I think that's how you say it. spell it. Yeah. Okay. So going on, we're going to read 11 through 15. Let me check to see if you have any questions. Okay. Destiny, what did I underline in verse 4? Sorry. Um. So verse 4, I basically bracketed the whole verse because... My thought was for the complete verse, but I just underlined great in the king's house. Things spread throughout and grew more and more powerful because these are all things that um, basically took place with Mordecai. And I wanted to be able to quickly look at that and then look at my note, though the note was for the complete verse four. Hopefully that makes sense. So just let me know if that just made sense, Destiny. And again, for verse 4, the note that I put was, um, he was a man of influence and power, which I can see because it says um, he grew more and more powerful. He never took power for granted. His fame spread throughout because I don't, I don't think they would spread fame about him, um, make him famous out of, the, out of bad, if that made sense. Um, he cared for the people and his favor with God gave him favor with the Persian Empire. So, that's why he was great in the king's house. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so, moving on, we're going to read 11 through 15. Let me just make sure there's no more comments, no questions. Okay. So, 11 through 15. Starting at verse 11, that... Very day, the number of those killed in Susa, the citadel, was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, in Susa, the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and also the 10 sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king provinces? Now, what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, if it please the king. Let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to the day's edict, and let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. Verse 15, the Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they killed three hundred men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. So that's all of that. I don't think I had anything I wanted to. Yes, I did. I wanted, I circled please because I just feel like that's one of Esther's favorite words. And I really truly want to define what that means. So for please. Um, 
I have to make happy or satisfied. To afford or give pleasure or satisfaction. To afford or give pleasure or satisfaction. Right? Yeah, okay, satisfaction. So that was the only word that I, um, wanted to define so for verse 12 I underlined the king said to Queen Esther and I'm underlining, uh, now what is your wish? It shall be granted you, and what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. So the queen said, the king said to Queen Esther, let's do this peach and this pink. So, starting with the peach, verse 12. Um, the king said to Queen Esther, so basically the king made sure to rely or relay all that took place to Esther. I feel like he felt obligated to let her know how her people were doing um, against those that were following the first edict, especially because she, her and Mordecai created the second edict. So I felt like he felt obligated to tell her what was going on um, because he probably felt bad about what happened, especially being that he basically signed off on the first edict to kill her people without really knowing. So. The king. Sorry about that if you guys hear my brother there. He's home from the laundry, so. Yeah, he's a little loud. The king felt obligated to let her know. Let her know how her people were doing. And then verse 12 again. Where it says, now what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. Again, the king has asked her this probably three or four times now throughout the book of Esther. Um, always asking her what is her wish? What is her uh, her request? And things like that. And I just feel like um, he's always seeking to make her happy is what I personally feel. Now, verse 12 is nothing factual. What I'm the notes that I'm sharing with you guys are not factual notes as like the other notes that I'm giving you. This is more of my opinion of what I'm reading. I just wanted to state that because um, I know sometimes notes can be confused because some are more factual and scriptural than others. Verse 12 is strictly on my own opinion of what I picked up throughout reading the book of Esther. So when he said, um, Sorry, when it says the king said to Queen Esther and he told her, I personally feel like he felt obligated to let her know how her people were doing, considering um, he agreed to the first edict and couldn't revoke it. So he then signed off on a second edict. And then I also feel like him asking her what is her wish and her request yet again for the third or fourth time is kind of like him showing his love, his care for her and really wanting to um, please her. So... He wanted to please the queen.
that's pretty much it. And like I said, for chapter nine, I didn't really have a lot of notes um, that were really factual just because I didn't really pick up quite a lot from it personally. But, um, okay, so 13, if it please the king. The favorite line of Queen Esther because, you know, she's a woman of grace and her words are seasoned with it. So if it please the king... Then let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to the days this day's edict. Yes. And then also let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So for those of you who are new to the study um, or who will see this obviously on YouTube, gallows basically are, um, is not somewhere like where they hang people. It's more of like those long, long stakes that they basically plunged a person onto. If you watch any kind of movie like 300 or like them really old, um, them really old, old movies with the castles and the wars. I can't, I can't even think of the shows right now from the top of my head, um, but the, the shows with the kings and the queens and they have those long stakes out on the front of their, um, their castles and you see the heads on or the bodies on that's a gallow that was what a gallow was back in the day so it's kind of like a wooden stake or a wooden beam that your body was then plunged onto so yeah <laughs> but um verse 13 if it please the king the favorite line of queen esther because she is a woman of grace Basically, um, she speaks once again with reverence to the king, understanding that he could definitely change things for the better or even the worse. Um, she spoke with grace. She spoke with grace and reverence, understanding... her role and I mean no matter what situation she was put in she always made sure that she spoke with grace to the king all of her words were intentional they weren't out of the the woodworks or something like that they all had a purpose and she still honored him regardless of what was going on with her and her people let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to today's edict. So basically Esther may have seemed to show a lack of love towards her enemies, but she displayed a lot of the same principles that are found in the book of Joshua. Um, she basically didn't settle for anything other than total victory. And we as God's children will never have partial victory. We always have total victory. And if it's not total victory, then that means the battle isn't yet over for us. So um, she just wanted to ensure that she had the complete total victory and not partial victory. So I'm just going to write my note here quickly and then show you guys. So verse 13. So basically, Esther wanted total victory, not partial. God's children always have complete victory and never partial. Um, if it's partial victory, that means the battle isn't over.
to let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. Um, and that basically goes back into what I was saying for verse 7 through 10, which I'll obviously repeat again um, because it makes more sense when I explain it this way. So, uh, what is it? Basically, Haman and his sons were descendants of the ancient Elim Amalekites. Um, God commanded Saul, who was the son of Kish, to execute the full extent of God's judgment against the Amalekites. But Saul clearly fell because he saved the king, um, which was Agag. Um, but later, his ascendant of the tribe of Benjamin and a son of Kish named Mordecai completed God's judgment against the Amalekites. So, we have Saul and Agag, who was the king of the Amalekites. God commanded that Saul kill and destroy all of the Amalekites. He refused to do so. He killed the people, kept the king alive, which I don't understand why you would keep the king alive of your enemies. But he kept the king alive. So um, years later, you now have Mordecai and Haman. Mordecai is from the, line, the family line of Saul. And then you have... Haman, who was from the family line of Agag, who was an Amalekite, which God said that he wanted all of them destroyed. So now you have Mordecai and Haman. Basically, Haman sought to kill Mordecai due to him not honoring him and all this other stuff, which I think was also personal as we studied back in, I think it was chapter 2 or chapter 3, um, when they introduced Haman. And we understand that they're both from these from a generational feud basically between the Israelites and the um or the Jews and the Amalekites and now you have God's judgment which was to Saul to kill and utterly destroy all of the Amalekites passed on to Mordecai to now kill Haman though Mordecai did not use, do it by his own hand he still was involved within that so I hope that makes sense every time I say things out loud I feel like it does not make sense but it makes sense in my head and when I'm looking at the notes on paper. Um, so if it doesn't make sense out loud, you guys, for verse 13, I have the notes completely written down. But basically, the judgment that um, God gave to Saul to kill all of Amalekite, he failed. He kept the king alive. The king ended up somewhere down the line having Haman. Then you have Mordecai, who's from Saul's line. Mordecai is involved with Haman being killed. So now... Not only is Haman killed, but all of his ten sons. So there's no longer any line to the Amalekites. They're all completely gone. Zeresh is still alive, but Zeresh can always marry someone else. She does not carry the bloodline of the Amalekites. So, um, how can I say this? God's judgment against the Amalekites. Against the... I'm saying probably saying it wrong, but I'm going to say Amalekites because... Yep. I'm going to say it failed. With Saul... But was completed with Mordecai and the same kind of scriptures, which are Second Samuel. Was no, sorry, it's First Samuel fifteen, two and three, and then eight through thirty-three. And then I have another cross-reference, which is Galatians 3.13. So we already read 1 Samuel 15, 2, 3, and then 8 to 33, which is about Saul and um, God's command to him. But I'm going to skip ahead to Galatians. And Galatians 3.13. And whoops, we can get over here. Through 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So, uh, 
Hangman and his sons were basically cursed. Um, they were hanged on the gallows. They weren't hanged the way Jesus was, obviously, but um, they still were on the gallows. So, And let me finally do this one. Okay. Just want to make sure there's no comments. Okay, so moving on to 14. Um, so the king commanded this be done. The last part of note 13. Um, are you talking about pertaining to what I said about the ten sons of Haman on the gallows, Destiny? Um, if you're referring to that part where it says the la let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows, I will show it to you. Um, basically, I wrote that God's judgment against the Amalekites failed with Saul, but was completed with Mordecai. And then I had the scriptures of 1 Samuel 15, verse 2 to 3, and then 8 to 33. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to read the complete thing that I have on the printable. Basically, um, where it says, let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. I have that Haman and his sons were descendants of the ancient Amalekites. God commanded Saul to execute the full extent of his judgment against the Amalekites, but Saul basically failed um, because he left the king Agai alive. But this later descendant of the tribe of Benjamin, who is Mordecai, completed God's judgment against the Amalekites. Basically, Mordecai completed that because Haman was now killed. And then Esther ensured that the ten sons of Haman were killed. So there are no longer any Amalekites um, in the world, like period. They were all wiped out at the beginning when Saul was king until he left the king Agai alive. And then Mordecai came and finished that off along with Esther with killing Haman and his ten sons. So there's no longer anyone within that um, family tree, family line of the Amalekites. Okay, so first, you're welcome, Destiny. <laughs> so, uh, 14, so the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. Uh, moving on to 15. 15. Nope, not 15. 16, but I'm going to read all of 16 through 19. So, like I said, again, I'm going to keep saying it. Not a lot of notes. For chapter 9 because it was really more so on their victory and them killing and I didn't personally find a lot of notes if you guys yourselves have any notes that I don't have definitely don't be afraid to share them because I would love to see what you guys um, found out for chapter 9 just for me personally reading it through and studying it and even looking throughout all of my study Bibles there weren't a lot of notes pertaining to this um, chapter so now going on to read 16 through 19. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar on the 14th, and on the 14th day they rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th day and rested on the 15th day, making that a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in, a rural, in the rural towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. So... Did I have any words here that I wanted to define? I think I did, um, which was gladness. 
yes just gladness which i circled and um the definition for that i'll put here is having a cheerful or happy disposition by nature having a cheerful or happy disposition by nature uh, and experiencing joy, pleasure, or delight. Okay. So for 16... I underlined, sorry, the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives. And actually, let me fix this camera to come down a bit. That's better. Okay, so the rest of the Jews who were killed, I'm sorry, the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives. Um, they never ceased to help one another fend off their enemies. They worked as a unit. And that kind of reminds me of how we as the church um, and as Christians should be united in fighting our enemy um, and his forces, which is obviously Satan and his demons. So I don't know. I just felt like that reminded me that uh, the church and Christians as a whole need to work as a unit to defend ourselves, um, to defend our lives and the lives of of God's other children out there in the world who are lost or who don't know. So, reminder that the church and Christians need to be united against the enemy because sadly we're not united we're not a united force and we're not a united front at all um people tend to let other people deal with their enemies on their own um when it comes to sin and satan and i feel like We've been told to work together. Um, it's been written in the Bible, yet none of us do it. Um, so this just reminds me that these Jews made sure that they were together helping one another. And we need to do the same. We need to help each other. And gladness will be green. Um, and then I also underlined got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them. So that's 16, right? Verse 16, yes. Sorry if you guys hear my brother. <laughs> Um, but basically, God made sure that those who were against his children would be removed without problem. So, I'm just going to put God ensured victory over enemies. And then I have a cross reference, which is Leviticus 26, 7 through 8. Let's get some color, which will be orange, just because. So 
Leviticus 26, 26 and 7 through 8. Um, you shall chase your enemies and you sh and they shall, sorry, okay. Let me get this right because, you know, so 26, 7 through 8 is right here. It says, you shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall chase 10,000 and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. And basically that's what, that's what happened. I'm not sure how many jews that were um defending themselves but obviously there were not that many jews compared to those who weren't jews in the persian empire and they were able to kill seventy-five thousand people that hated them so they definitely were low in numbers but still greater despite the low in numbers because they killed so many people so 17 um where is it? On the 14th day here, they rested and made the day of feasting and gladness. And then for 18, I'm just going to underline, I'm going to keep underlining and then go to writing my notes afterwards. For 18, um, I'm going to underline the Jews who were in Susa. Rested on the 15th day, making that a day of feasting and gladness. Um, the Jews of the villages hold the 14th day for gladness and feasting. Okay. So, for 17, I underlined, um, on the 14th day, the rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness and this pertains to the jews um that were in the villages so jews in i'm gonna say the country Finished off their enemies. In a day, which was the 13th. They completed this on the 13th. Um, and then... Had the chance... To give thanks to God through their feasting. Then for 18, Jews in the city took two days to clear enemies. And then rested giving thanks to God so Again, I'm sorry if you hear my brother. So for 18, we're using this purple. And 17, this pink. Um, now, verse 19, the Jews of the villages hold the 14th day for gladness and feasting. Um, I'll just use this blue. 
And I don't really have a note for that, but I found some cross references for that. So I have Nehemiah 8 and 10. So Nehemiah 8 and 10 is here. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord and not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is the strength. So, and it'll make that, that cross reference will make sense as we get further into the rest of the scripture but um that's nehemiah 8 10 and then revelations 11 10 as well which is all the way at the back wow okay i did not know that there was a reading plan in the back of this <laughs> bible or I forgot, but yep, did not know that. So Revelations eleven ten. So eleven ten, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents, because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. Um, I would say eleven ten part A and not part B. So, Revelations um, 11, 10, A. Is all I'm going to put. And that's that. If you guys have any questions, quickly just look at that. We are almost done, ladies. Wow. Can't believe it. Like, literally, we're almost done with this. So crazy. So crazy. Yeah. So, reading 20 to 22. Um, and 20 down to, I think, 32 it is, is all about the Feast of Purim being um, instituted as well as... There was also a feast called the Feast of Esther, but this book doesn't call it that. I'm sorry, this Bible doesn't call it that or title it that, but um, this is about the feast being um, established or inaugurated, as it says. So, verse 20 to 22. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obligating them to keep the 14th day of the month Adar and also the 15th day of the same year by year. Verse 22. As the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month that had been turned from them, sorry, as the month that had turned had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness, and from mourning into holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So, words that I wanted to define were. Obligating Hold on, I think I went a little ahead. Yeah, okay, so no, there's no words that I wanted to define for this part because those words are actually for the next part. So skipping the definitions. <laughs> um oh wait, no, I'm sorry guys. Going back to verse 18 and 19, I forgot I did have a note for that. Um, so for 18 and 19, where it says the Jews who were in Susa rested on the 15th day, making that a day of feasting and gladness. And then the Jews of the villages hold theirs on the 14th day. Um, basically, I had one note that I had put for both of them. And I am going to uh, bracket this, I guess. 
bracket 18 to 19. I almost forgot about that. And let's play with this gray because I'm obsessed with this gray color. Obviously, it's a pretty color for a highlighter. Um, so basically, for verses 18 and 19, I have that uh, both Jews in the country and those in the city celebrated their festival the very day after they finished their work and gained their points. Um, when we receive signals of mercies from God, we ought to be quick and speedy in making our thankful returns to him while the mercy is fresh and impressions of it are most sensible. So basically, in short, once they received mercy and got victory, they immediately gave thanks to God. They didn't wait to give thanks to God, which is something that we, I think, as people of um, Christ tend to do. We tend to hold out on giving thanks until we feel like giving thanks instead of immediately doing so and i find that that's something that i used to struggle with but now when something good happens i make sure to immediately give thanks to god whether i'm saying thank you jesus thank you god or if i'm saying it mentally in my mind i make sure to give thanks to him um for waking me up for having a meal on my table um if someone compliments me i still thank god for that because i feel like that's his way of communicating to me through someone and i mean a a proper compliment hopefully that makes sense like yesterday I was on the bus and this lady was sitting with me next to me on the bus talking to another lady who I guess um is a new Christian and she was a gang member and all that other stuff and she had got out of that and the lady sitting next to me was telling her how um people need not put her mouth on her because God uses the foolish to confound the wise he takes those who are in gangs he takes those who um have never gone to seminary school he takes those who are the least to prove his his glory to give him glory to show his glory um and to save those who are more prideful kind of like how he did with Mordecai and um Haman or how he did with Esther compared to the other women within the um harem so we need to immediately give thanks to God um once we gain his mercy don't wait on that because there's no guarantee that tomorrow is going to even come for us he may decide not to give us tomorrow so um immediately give thanks to God as they did it's as simple as that they immediately gave God thanks they did not wait around and I mean they probably did wait a few hours because I'm pretty sure it took them forever to kill these people but um, even still, they made sure within a day that they gave God all the glory for what he did for them. Which then goes back into um, verse 20, which now I'll get into. <laughs> um, so, yeah, verse 20. Um, so I don't have anything for verse 20, but I do for 21, which says obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month and also the 15th and if you guys don't know the month of Adar um, I did explain this in previous chapters but Adar basically in calendar months of how we do it would be February March about that time so um, Adar is February March so I'll just quickly circle it and put February March. I can't remember which um, chapter study it was, but I did put a table of their um, the months and how it's incorporated into how we look at our months. Okay, so obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and also the 15th day. Basically, these two days institute the days of Purim for the Jews or the Jewish. So, instituted the Feast of Purim. So 
22, where is it, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies. So I'm underlining that. I'm going to also go down to turned for them, sorrow into gladness, and then from mourning into a holiday. So again, um, as the, in verse 22, I have, As the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, turned for them sorrows into gladness, and then I also underline from mourning into a holiday. Basically, God will never leave his people in chaos, pain, or sorrow. If it's not good, then he is not yet finished with you. God will always make it so you are filled with peace, happiness, and joy. So, God is always... with his people if it's not good it's not finished and then the cross reference I have is Psalms 30 yes yeah, Psalms 30 and 11 That's a really pretty green color. So Psalms 30 and 11. Let's quickly read that. I'm going to try when we do um, the next Bible study to have my cross references marked ahead of time. But that still probably won't work because there's going to be a lot of cross references. So Psalms 30 and 11, yes, 30, 11, um, here, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. So they're no longer wearing their sackcloth that they were earlier, earlier on in, um, the book of Esther when they found out what was taking place. Um, they're now dancing and they're happy and they're feasting and eating. And like I said, when we read, um, I think it was seven. I think it was chapter seven we were reading. Yeah, when we were reading chapter seven, a feast is something that you do when you have victory. So they were now victorious after all of this stuff going on um, with the people of the Persian Empire. So moving on, I'm going to read. I'm going to read 23 down to 24, and then we're going to jump into 25 since it goes to the back. But, um, so the Jews accepted that they had start, start, sorry. So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them. 24, for Haman the Agite, and Agites are basically those from the king, the king Agag, who was, um, an Amalekite. So they're no longer... Amalekites are now Agites because the Amalekites were all killed, but Agites are still Amalekites. For the for Haman the Agite, the son of Pemetitha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast Pur, that is, cast lots. So Pur is basically to cast lots, um, to crush and to destroy them. So the only thing I'm really going to do is I'm going to circle Agite and I didn't even have this on um, my notes and then for per I'm going to box that because the definition is already there and then for Agite I'm going to make a note that um, this was Agag the king of the Amalekites. 
so that the, I understand that um, the Agites are still Amalekites. That's just their new name. And then for Pur, I know that it is to cast lots. So I'm not going to have to define that. You know, it's a subtle change from Amalekite to Agag's, but people could get confused. So, Agag is basically Agag the king who was over the Amalekites. So, Agag's are basically the new version of the Amalekites. So, going on to 25. But when it came before the king and he gave orders in writing that his evil sorry but when he came before the king he gave orders in writing that his evil plan that he had devised against the jews should return on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows 26 therefore they called this these days purim after the term pur or poor therefore because of all that was written in this letter and of what they had faced in this matter, and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them, that without fail they would keep these two days according to that, according to what was written at the time appointed every year. That these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation in every clan, province, and city, and that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants okay so now i can define the words that i wanted to define which are all in this so we have firmly obligated um remembered and commemoration So for firmly, I don't even know why I'm using this and not the Sharpie pen. That's why it looks crazy. So firmly, it's securely or solidly fixed in place. Securely, yeah. Or solidly. Let me plug my laptop in because that's getting ready to die on me. And then move my laptop over here. Sorry guys, just moving my laptop here so that I can see better. <laughs> okay. So, um, securely or solidly, fixed in place, not subject to change. not easily moved or disturbed obligated is to bind legally or morally Submit to meet an obligation.
remembered. Retain in the memory. And lastly is commemoration. Um, Okay, my hand hurt from all of that. <laughs> but, um, friendly is securely or solidly fixed in place, not subject to change or revision, and not easily moved or disturbed. Obligated is to bind legally or morally and to commit to meet an obligation. Remembered is to retain in the memory, bring to mind, or keep in mind for attention, and commemoration is something that is intended to honor an important event or person from the past. Let's get some color on here again. Firmly obligated. Mm. No, I don't want to use that. <laughs> Remembered, and that's it for the definitions for this chapter. Let's go back one. Okay. So I have all of my definitions now. Let me move the ribbon out the way. Okay. So, verse 25. Um, down here it says, but when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that his evil plan, so I'm going to underline, that his evil plan that he devised against the Jews should return on his, I'm going to come back up here and do own head. Um, so God will never let anyone best his children, even if he lets them over you. God ultimately can remove the enemy in an instant. So God will not let anyone best his children. The enemies will fail. Okay, see, Job 5.12 is a cross-reference. And Psalm 7.16. This was probably not the best place to put this note because my handwriting looks like chicken scratch. But, hey. So while that's setting in, I'm going to go to Job 5.12. 
Five twelve, which is up here, if I can get it. Okay, he frust he frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. So that's exactly what happened with Haman. Um, they didn't he he didn't win at all. He was not successful. And the same with the enemies of the Jews that chose to listen to the first edict that was written. And then Psalm seven sixteen. His mischief returns upon his own head and on his own skull his violence descends, which is the same thing that happened with both Haman and the enemy of the Jews. Haman sought to hang um, Mordecai on the gallows. He basically was executed on the gallows that he made for Mordecai. The Persian Empire's um, enemies of the Jews sought to kill them. They basically were killed themselves, so... You know, be careful because God will make sure that you reap what you sow. <laughs> and he will never fail at making that happen. It is 1147. We are almost done. All right. Um... So what I can do actually is stick this post-it note. Let me just because I'm not gonna need this post-it note anymore. So I'm just taking out the extra excess. I can stick this here and then the definitions underneath so these are the notes and there are the definitions there for that so no more post-its are needed since we are done basically just about um and I'm also going to underline sorry that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows So the very thing Haman created for Mordecai's destruction was turned upon himself and his children. And also the sins of a parent can run down to the children, causing them to take the punishment and or consequences. So this is like a twofold kind of thought. So um, one. And I say that um, that part that I'm getting ready to write, the sins of a parent can run down to the children, causing them to take the punishment and or consequences. That itself is a twofold situation because you have the children of Agag, of Agag, um, well, his name is Agag, but they're called Agag. So you have Agag who should have died, but didn't die because of his sins toward the Israelites during their, um, I guess their exodus out of Egypt. Um being punished all of his people were killed by Saul but he was kept alive so then he moved and no longer was calling them Amalekites they were called Agites now and eventually he dies obviously and my fiance is calling me and I'm teaching so I can't answer that sorry babe <laughs> I have to let him know later but um so you have that so now the punishment that was due for Agag is now moved on to Haman and Haman's punishment for what he did to Mordecai is now moved on to his children. So.
Moving on to verse 28 is where I wanted to start underlining um, that these days should be remembered. I have kept throughout every generation. And then these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews. So, for that these days should be remembered. I basically put that the principle of remembering God's great deliverance is good. Um, we too often forget his great works and the mercies that he's given us. So, uh, trying to get this so it's not hard to see, but And I think it's important because a lot of us do forget, like, when God has brought us up out of something um, and we feel like we did it on our own when we really didn't. I know for me, I used to be depressed, um, like, heavily depressed to the point where I thought about suicide and I was just so closed off and always preferred to be my, my, by myself and kept quiet. And um, I got delivered from that. And it took years, you guys. I mean, from 2009 up until... 2017 um yeah it, it took years for me to be delivered from that and I make sure that I thank God every day and um there you know there are days when I feel myself kind of slightly fall back into like a small slip of depression um like around my birthday time I'm normally happy about my birthday but this year I don't know I just wasn't excited about it um the closer it got to my birthday I got really depressed and down and sad because just just basically it was kind of like my life flashed before me and I was remembering things and going through things in my mind and it was making me really sad but um then I remembered that you know being 27 now God really has brought me out of a lot of things like a lot of things that I could not have done on my own I could have been dead basically I could have been dead I could have been in the streets doing things that are not um, proper there are so many ways my life could have gone um but he delivered me from a lot of things and specifically i'm talking about depression because that thing was on me for years you guys the spirit of depression was on me for years and it took my pastors a very long time to get me delivered from that spirit so i know for me for a fact that i love to um keep in mind to give him thanks and to just thank him for his mercy and his love and his power and his majesty because without him I would not be where I am today um I would not be speaking the word of God to other people because doing this would freak me out um it really would but just without him I wouldn't be able to do half the things that I do now so I feel like um that it's a principle of remembering his great deliverance and that's something that we need to continue to do and constantly do and not forget to do so um his great deliverance is good. And sorry if I sound a little shaky. I'm a little cold because my brother had the air on. I don't know if you guys heard it, but I'm cold. And I get cold really fast. So, yeah. Um, the principle of remembering God's great deliverance is good. Um, we too often... Forget his great works. His great work and mercy. And I'm actually watching, um, this is so like off topic, but I'm currently watching another sermon series from Pastor Michael Todd over at Transformation Church. And I just love his ministry. Um, one, because he's so down to earth and just chill, but he still delivers the word of God in a, such an effective way. I love listening to him and I'm watching Grace Like a Flood right now. And I think I've watched most of his latest sermons, but Grace Like a Flood, you guys, is phenomenal. I'm going to try to um, find the playlist for that and post it up in the group because I really love 
his ministry and his preaching style and um he very much tells his sermons in kind of like a story kind of storytelling type of way um and he really makes the scriptures come alive and he has fun with it and i love pastors who know how to have fun with scripture and who are not so gung-ho about being so theologically correct or looking and presenting themselves in a certain way because god i mean sorry not god jesus was not theologically correct he did the opposite of what people thought was correct so i like pastor michael todd from transformation church if you guys have never heard of him again i will post um a link to their youtube channel because i really love their sermons like if i can't make it to my own church on sundays i make sure to watch their sermons on sundays and um i think they completed grace like a flood so i'm going to be finishing up those two uh episodes i don't want to say episodes those two sermons this week but i'm trying to figure out what color i want to use sorry that was like so off topic guys but just wanted to share that all right let's take vermilion i think i use this color so there's no let's just take this color So, kept throughout every generation. Basically, it's not just for the Jews in that present time, but it was for those um, that were to come. So, basically, the generations in our time and the generation from back then in Bible times. So, for all Jews... That is... And is to come. It's really as simple as that. And these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews. Basically, the Jews are not allowed to dishonor the Day of Remembrance. You should not do anything to dishonor that day. Um... And then cross references are Joshua 4, verse 6 through 7, and then 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 2. And I'm getting ready to check the comment section. pink going okay so quickly reading those cross references which are joshua 4 6 and 7 and if i'm not mistaken joshua is up here yes so 4 6 and 7 right yeah so that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial, a memorial forever. So um, it's kind of like when that took place, but now they have a feast to do the remembering. So um, that's a day that should not be taken out of context or misused you should teach your children about the festival of Purim and what it truly means and why they remember that day and then first corinthians 11 24 and 25 
11, 24, and 25. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, um, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So this is another type of remembrance that we do, which is communion. Um, you know, Christians do communion the first of the month, which is a way for us to remember Jesus Christ and um, what he did for us on the cross. This is their remembrance for the Jews, the festival of Purim, where they can remember their deliverance and um, their victory. And basically not having been killed, simply put. Um, so, yeah, let me just check. The comment section. No problem, Latoya. I know s school is almost over for everybody's kids. Ugh, I wish my son had early dismissal, but he's in school all day for the rest of the week or rest of the time. Thank you, Stacy and Latoya. Um, I'm definitely going to be doing my testimony soon. I just get freaked out sharing my testimony because it's such a large, like, depression is just one of them, you guys. Like, I have so many things that I want to share with you guys, so many things that I was um, delivered from. But, you know, I'm slowly but surely working on those videos. It'll be a few videos where I share my testimony with you guys because I know for a fact that my testimony when I share it with people in person it does help them and I do want to share it on the internet but I know once it gets on the internet it's on the internet and um there are some people who uh were in are involved in a lot of the things some things that my mom like I said she doesn't even know everything she knows certain things and it's taken me years to tell her a few different things but um definitely going to be sharing my testimony really really soon probably by the end of summer i'll be making one of those videos but okay so moving on to the last few verses of chapter 9 which are 29 to 32 then queen esther the daughter of abihel and mordecai the jew gave full written authority confirming the second letter about Purim. letters were sent to all the jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of ahasuerus in words of peace and truth, um, peace and truth, okay, 31, that these days of Purim should be observed, be observed at their appointed season, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther obligated them, and as they obligated themselves and their offspring with regard to their fast and their lamenting. 32, the command of Esther confirmed these practices of Purim, and it was recorded in writing so don't need to um define anything but i am going to underline then queen esther confirming this second letter about poem uh i have a cross reference which is daniel 6 8 but um this part here just really shows me about her power and authority um i'm finally be finally seeing the power and authority that she has as the queen because she doesn't really exercise it a lot she's very much a very gracefully spoken woman um especially when it comes to the king she doesn't come and step out of order but in this though it's really small i still feel like i'm able to see her power and authority so And the cross-reference was Daniel 6, 8. Where is Daniel? Daniel, where are you? Oops, sorry about shaking the camera, you guys. 6, 8. Um, now, O king, establish an injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Persian Empire. Medes and the Persians, which is basically the Persian Empire, which cannot be revoked. 
um, and therefore King Darius signed the document in injunction. So basically, the king obviously had to sign off on this second. Oops, sorry. The king obviously had to sign off on this second letter. So that's why I have Daniel 6 and 8. But again, this is still telling me the power that Queen Esther holds. Um, I also want to underline... Where is it? Oh, in the words of peace. In words of peace and truth. Um, just because every word that Esther spoke, everything that she wrote was one of peace and truth, revealing that even in hard times, um, she can still bear beautiful fruit and honor God. So, um... So every word she speaks or writes are of peace and truth. She bears beautiful fruit. And honors God. in hard times and I think that's very powerful because I know for me if I was in her situation I don't think I would talk to the king in such a respectful manner um and not that it's purposely that I'm purposely not being respectful but I would be so frantic about what's going on with my people that I would feel the need to have to get my point across in some type of loud obnoxious way um, but the queen was very graceful about everything she did. She was very kind about how she spoke to the king. She was kind with her people. And even in her seemingly being evil, um, when she asked that the Jews in Susa be granted another day to kill their enemies, as well as, um, have Haman's sons be, being hang, hanged and on the gallows, she was still very graceful about everything that she said so that is pretty much it for chapter nine yep, chapter nine um quickly basically chapter nine was all about the victory of the jews um that they had over those seeking to harm them because god was on their side and though it focuses mainly on them killing these people in the first half and then the second half is mainly all about the feast of Purim being instituted I personally see God working his providential hand once again all throughout chapter 9. Um, you can basically see him as a provider, a protector, a refuge, um, his acts as a father protecting his children. And um, yeah, it, it's amazing. And the institution of the Festival of Purim is basically in honor of Queen Esther as well as God delivering his people. So I will have a little um, chart on the printable that talks about the festival of Purim, which has the name, the time, the purpose, and the practices that were taking place. So that is on the chart when you guys get it. Mm -hmm.